So um, I think we'll go ahead. It's about five minutes late. That's uh, when do you start church? The service. We have many beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Rocky can attest. <laughs> well, it's delightful to be here. Home City is one of the sort of genius um, features of Montpelier, and obviously Kellogg Hubbard Library does an incredible job putting it together. But I think they also got um, clever or smart or whatever this year by doing a kind of open source and allowing people to bring projects or events to them, which is a great way of doing it, because I think they used to organize them, and then somebody would complain, well, why didn't you choose me for anything, you know, or whatever. But they've done a great job, and I think it's worked really well. Is, is that your feeling about it? I think people have been having a good time and making connections. Yeah. I think people are meeting new people and talking about poetry, and that seems great. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And Joan, we're delightful, delighted to be here. Thank you so much for allowing us to partner with the church. I, ha I have to say, as a congregational minister for years, my parishioners all suspected I was a Unitarian. <laughs> and they were pretty much right. It's, it's, that's my daughter, Emily, and grandchildren. And, um, and um, so this feels like very at home. Um, Wonderful. So thank you. Thank I'd you. like to give a shout out to the library, Kellogg Hubbard Library, because there was a really great, good article in, tell me, The Bridge? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, like a couple page spread yes. on yes. the purpose and the offerings of yep. of poetry, Home yeah. yeah. City, Home City. So I think that was a great idea. Yeah. So I'm actually, I think we're a small enough group. I would, let's just quickly introduce ourselves. Um, because this is a workshop type format, and I'd love to do that. So, I'm George Long at our car from Middlesex. And he's a poet. And a poet. <laughs> and I'm Susan Sussman, also from Middlesex, got her spouse, and I'm a poet appreciator. <laughs> I'm Laura Gewissler, also from Middlesex. Wow. Interesting. Um, we live on Culver Hill oh. Road. Uh, I'm a retired UVM librarian and a uh, beginning sort of aspiring poet. Writer, poet, yeah, yeah great, yeah. wonderful. Hi, my name's Margaret. I actually live a bit south in Barnard, Vermont. Oh, great. And I was just, um, <clears throat> I actually just rented an office though in Montpelier, so I'm great. just kind of, uh, was looking for things to do and people to meet and um, great. You know, to wonderful. see what it's like. And I enjoy poetry and spiritual things as well. Mm -hmm. Could you say your name again? Margaret. Thank you. I'm Sandra. I live in Montpelier, and I think Poetry Month is wonderful. Right. I'm Vida. I live in Worcester, and uh, somebody said at a workshop that I attended last week, a reading that Sam read at, that she was a closet poet, and I think it probably describes me. I've been writing poetry since I was six. Well, you've got at least a foot out of the closet. At right? least. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm looking forward to this and really happy to meet all of you. I'm Sam Stock. I'm a poet and a teacher at CCB. And a city councilor in Barry City. <coughs> yes, <laughs> just won re-election to the yes. city council yeah. in Barry. I'm Cashel Higgins. I'm Scudder's grandchild. I'm Ryan Higgins. I'm also Scudder's Emily Higgins, and we all live in Waterbury. Gaya, um, currently from East Montpelier, and also a poet. Great. I'm Rocky, I live in Montpelier, and um, was drawn in by the, the invitation to look at wonder as a marginalized experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Joan Javier Duval, live in Montpelier, and I'm the minister of this church, um, and really glad to have this workshop happening mm -hmm. here. So if you weren't going to, would you say a word about this yes, about person work. recording? Yeah. Uh, you. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Finn Cook from Montpelier, I work for Orca Media, and I will be recording this uh, wonderful meeting here. Great. Okay. And if does any, if anybody has any concerns about that, we're just to be posted, just to be clear for everyone, to be posted on Orca Media okay. website, yeah. Okay. So it's, 
I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I mean, I think, I, and I don't think there's any, and, and in a sense I maybe hope there isn't any really structured way that we think about wonder or awe, we could use that word just as well. And there is somebody who's out now talking about awe and got interviewed by Krista Tippett and the eight kinds of awe and stuff like that. I'm not gonna do that. But that's not what I'm doing or here to do. Although it's useful. Um, one of the things that this person does talk about is um, there are various vehicles through which we experience something that opens us up to something bigger than ourselves and somehow also grounds us in a sense of, oh, that's who I am, that's what I am, that's the way I want the world to be. And those are really the features of it that seem to me um, what I'd like to have a chance to talk with people about today. Um, and I do think it's marginalized and channelized. And I, I, forgive me if this is um, offensive to anyone, but sometimes the Christian church has taken those mystical experiences and kind of standardized them. Okay, this is a conversion experience. And once you have this exper experience, you have come to the Lord and now you believe everything that the church says you should believe. And it's sort of like uh, an access through that opening into something that's a little bit more restrictive and channelized, um, or sometimes very restrictive and channelized. So the experience of wonder, we don't know how to deal with it. We don't think that we control it in the sense that, OK, Thursday morning, I'm going to have this mystical experience or this uh, great insight. Um, so what I've done is just pick a bunch of uh, poems, really just kind of a super, well, not superficial, but just a quick run through my file of special poems. And um, so if anybody wants to read one of these at some point during the time um, you know that we're doing the readings, we can do that if you haven't brought something of your own. There we go. Um, but I wanted to read the first one, which just by Derek Walcott, who was um, born and raised in St. Lucia and in Trinidad, and then taught for years at Boston and won a Nobel laureate. Um, love, love after love is it's it's sort of somewhere in in your packet. Which packet? The love of body or? No, no. Um, no. I'm sorry. In the other one, the other. Second to last page. The second to the last page. Yes. And would anyone like to read it? Read it. Okay. Okay. Love after love, Derek Walcott. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. So one of the aspects of this is that um, poems about wonder usually just make me a puddle of tears, um, or often do that, because there is some kind of trigger of, for me, I think I describe it as recognition. It's like, oh, that's... And I think there's an element that I would call um, contradiction in wonder, and that the experience of wonder contradicts our normal experience 
by opening up something that feels real in a way that ordinary life doesn't. Um, and it contradicts that um, the despair, the grumpiness, the, the horrible news, the pandemic, whatever, but it, it sort of says, oh no, there's something different. And the contradiction is in part where, for me, the, the, the emotions come forward. Um, I'm going to tell this story. We watch, Susan gets me occasionally to watch um, the um, Finding Your Roots. Finding Your Roots with, um, I need to assist at this point in my life for any name of anything. And, um, and he had Angela Davis on. Mm -hmm. And he did this interview, you know, but if you, I don't know whether anybody has seen it, but he does this interview with, basically he tells the story of someone's life to them and reveals it in, the, in this book that he's prepared for them. You wanted to say your name? Sarah? Sure, my name is Sarah Bruget. I apologize for oh, being with you. Great to have you. And um, Angela Davis, you know, who we all knew as kids as this, you know, wonderful, um, but very, often very angry, radical. Um, he discovers that one of the white men who, you know, probably forcibly um, had a relationship with an ancestor of hers, entitles her to be qualified for the Daughters of the American Revolution. <laughs> 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 And for me, that was an amazing, and she smiled, she struggled, she said, oh my God. And then she said, I don't know, but the, my, my sense is that she said in a sense, okay, I'll take that. Mm. And then there, there's this way that she claimed, you know, her whole history and said, okay, that's a part of it. And it was, that was a moment for me of, um, what I would call wonder. So, anyway, that's a lot. Um, any comments or thoughts about it? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for me, it was looking in my bathroom mirror. Yeah. Um, I'm 81, and I was struggling when I turned to 80. Uh -huh. I've got that coming up, so I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it was weird to be the same age as old people. <laughs> and that's not my line. I don't know where that's from, but it's a great line. But anyway, my grandmother would come to the bathroom every morning in that big mirror, well lit, and I would just look at her, and I'm like, what? Because I look so much like her that I didn't realize I looked like her, but suddenly I'm 80 and 81, and I'm her. You know, all the, anyway. And, and it was just, now it's wonder. Now it's like accepting. Um, it was a, a journey to get there. But she kept showing up every morning. And I'm like, Effie, come on. And this poem has the mirror in yeah. it, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that was big. So that, that's a great story. Thank you. Um, so the other thing I think I want to say is this is Poetry doesn't have any monopoly on wonder. What I am saying is I think it's actually a very useful way of finding access to it and um, maybe an openness to it that some of the other modes of communication we get don't offer. I would say there are others. Music you know, can turn you into a puddle and the right words and the right song or just the right notes um, can do the, exactly the same. Art, you know, so there's no monopoly to poetry, but what I wanted to do is talk about poetry as one ac access to it. This, so this is not about poetry and wonder equal each other or this is the only way to get there, but it is the sort of what we're looking at today. So the, the other thing I want to talk about briefly is that, as I've said, the wonder gets used in different ways and gets abused or denied in different ways. So I wanted to read a couple of poems about my experience growing up as a preacher's kid, as a minister 
and then as someone who left the ministry. So the, the, that's sort of what I'm doing. I'm still going to do a little bit of that. Hope it's not too much. And we can stop after each poem and people can ask. So, so I'm going to start by reading Beloved Body. Our second spring in Hardwick, I was 16 and lusting hopelessly after Jackie LaCour. I wasn't supposed to fall in love with a Catholic because they'd make you raise your children for the Pope, my father said. So when I offered, half joking, full of hope, to give back her pictures if she paid for each one with a kiss, and she said yes without hesitation, I panicked and sent them to her in the mail. Every Sunday, my father stood in the confidence of his black robe, poured the unction of his words over the congregation. I watched from the choir faces like familiar rocks along a shore, part waiting for, part submitting to the tide. His determined giving began three years before after the fire claimed our home. He started preaching like his father. Steadily, God mushroomed in our family, finally moving in like a determined aunt who used to visit only occasionally, but now had come to set things right. It was a weekend in that second spring. I was in the house alone. I woke, senses quickened, heart thrilled with an astonishing, astonished patience. A sweet taste haunted my mouth, fed me like no food I could remember. I knew for the first time I am at home in this beloved body. Knowledge, not insistence, even sadness welcomed. My mind filled with promises, hands restless to press, to bless. It stayed for days, still echoes. No name for such amazement, so I called it love. Clothed it in a white robe called conversion which is the only category I had for what, whatever had happened to me. I don't remember the pictures clearly or how I got them, black and white snapshots of girls I knew clowning at a slumber party. Jackie stopped me in the hall at school, standing close to thank me for them. She smiled, said she wanted to be friends. Suddenly, there was no danger. Taste of her lips, shape of her breasts went with her as she left. I began to think I could survive under cover of goodness. I felt the holy promiscuity of saints, a yielding, terrible, and all-consuming that's both delight and subtle flight. That summer, she went out with Annie LeMay. It seemed like power to take fear, train it to be generous. They seemed to love me for it. It felt pure. I needed something pure. I never thought of it as sacrifice. For the first time, I could taste the metallic residue of one. So I, I don't know, it's sort of a complicated poem, but it's about how that experience for me, I didn't, it was too big for me. I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I didn't know how it fit into my life. And so part of what I did was turn it into being a good person. And that, that seemed like a good way to survive in that environment. And I don't think there's a lot of virtue in that, although it's probably a better choice than some. Um, but um, it did end up let, somehow losing some kind of connection. And that's a longing that I talk about. Is this, any thoughts or anybody? Can you talk about? about the transformation of that experience into the poem that you shared? Um, the, I think the way the poetry works for me, poetry is the way I process it. So I wrote this poem originally. This poem is titled Conversion. Um, and then I said, no, it's not about conversion. It's about wonder. Mm. So it's, it's a later life process of going back to an experience and reinterpreting it and doing it within the years that I've been working on this poem, which are not as many, it's quite a few, but not as many as my whole life. I don't know if that's responsive, but. Mm. So. 
Could you maybe talk about some of the structural choices you made in the poem? Um, the poem was once much more structured, and I broke it up. But that's something I've been doing with all my poems. Sort of, I'm giving up on commas, semicolons, you know. You go. <laughs> we, have, yeah. we have line breaks and gaps, and I like uh, capital letters and periods. So they're okay. <laughs> they work all right. Um, and then the placement tries to be um, <clears throat> open to um, just the rhythm of the thought and the, the language. Though I noticed for the first time in you were reading this that the pauses were in different places than your than the flow of the reading. Yeah. So just to notice yeah. that. Yeah. So then I went off and went to seminary and got married and became a minister and was a minister for years. And this is a poem that there are many other poems in between which we will not inflict on you today. Um, and this is called Comforter. And this is after I had rather dramatically uh, left the ministry, left my marriage, um, didn't really leave my kids, but um, I think it felt like that for a long time. And this is called Comforter. And I was in a relationship with Susan at the time. Across Route 100 from the yellow barn and outbuildings that were once the dairy farm for the state psychiatric hospital, a cedar hedge guards Waterbury's graveyard. And I think now I clear it's the Catholic graveyard. I think it is. the sign says that. I ask you to stop the car. It's midwinter, but I imagine a cluster of family and separated by the open grave, the one who by profession offers comfort. It's the moment after the last words have been said, the men who wait at a distance, leaning against the pickup truck, smoking cigarettes, shift at this pause, watching, watch the living ebb away. Their long-handled shovels can begin their work. I watch as they watched from my own distance. Every time I hoped the loveliness of grief might heal me, the sudden tumult of children's tears old men crying with the ungainliness of buildings coming down. I held the fine tool of the ceremony in my hands, asking without asking. They left me with silence, taking their lives back home. Two, I remember the summer when this farm was still making milk for the hospital, thick cream for coffee, and work for the inmates. I was an intern anxious to help the unfortunate. What I learned was how to change bedclothes for the dying, to clean excrement gently from the folds of unshared flesh. One night on the admissions ward, I held a glass of water toward a man with eyes too wild ever to see me. I learned to be almost good enough to quiet those wild eyes to help the hand reach from its darkness toward the glass. And I learned the quiet bargain of insistent goodness, how it can only think of leaving when it believes its work is done. Yesterday, a streak of winter sun crept across our bed. I lay down in that sun and called to you from somewhere you came and touched me. And so that's about, it's a phenomenon that I don't think is familiar to everyone, but I think a lot of human service people and clergy, like the insistent giving, the giving yourself almost away and, not, and somehow losing yourself and just trying to come to terms with that and find. When I left the ministry, I suddenly could feel sadness. Oh, hmm. And I, I, I dealt with grief all the time, but I could feel sadness in a whole different way. Can you imagine um, the kind of priests who aren't allowed to marry or have relationships? It's difficult for me. Mm. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if somebody chooses that, you know, or 
chooses more open relationships or something like that. But um, yeah, it's very hard. I, I like to, I think the phrase you use. The what? The phrase you use that clergy and others who offer assistance often um, find themselves giving themselves away too much that they don't know themselves. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it sort of goes back to that hint of the metallic taste, at, even when I was a kid, yeah. when I started figuring out how to do this as a survival mechanism. And maybe that's because it is a bit of a survival mechanism. If you were constantly to feel that level of empathy and grief that you're trying to console people with in your role yeah. as a caregiver, yeah. it's kind of, well, I can look at the clergy around here. And it's, uh, it's, or, it's, or children, of course. It's hard to, <laughs> hard to maintain that level of intensity all the time. Uh, so I guess it kind of speaks to that question of, you know, still looking for yourself while giving yourself away, yeah. in a way. Yeah, and you can't stand up there and cry during the service. It's, it's well, usually you not, yeah. not welcome. Or well, you can. You can. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, wonderful. Perspective on yeah, yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> I did this morning. So. <laughs> Good for you. Well, that, that's a, so, you know, we, we're working on it, yeah, right? I think, I think that's you can true. do that kind of work and not give yourself away. Yeah. And yeah. actually have boundaries that keep you mm. right. sort of honest. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make a general statement about public service or, right, right. you know, care, deep caring or professional helping relationships I'm talking about. But what, what I want to ask is for me was where did the wonder go in this, you know, where, where, the, that experience of wholeness. So um, I have more, yeah, were you going to say? Oh, um, no. <clears throat> I was raised Catholic, so anyone else? Well, like Catholic. Catholic. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of fun. So People, what, it's, it's just fun to be listening to other So what is it what is it else. what does it feel like? Oh, um I don't know. I think well so I think Catholicism gave me a lot of it's, there's so much ritual. Yeah. And um, oh, yeah. for example, and I now I do spiritual healing and I work with ritual a lot still, so I think it it instilled that in me. Um I think there's a lot of problems. I don't go to church anymore as a Catholic, but I also can't handle things like Unitarian <laughs> services. Yeah, I'm no. like, this is coffee hour. <laughs> you know what's happening? Yeah, yeah. Like, there's no like, you know, bringing in yeah. all the yeah. ritual and stuff. So, so interesting. I, absolutely. Yeah. And and I, I hope the stuff about my father, you know, and oh. um, that, the, the, the rampant anti-Catholic Catholic. Um, stuff and it, it it did go both ways, Maybe. but it was definitely Protestant oh, judgment yeah. of Catholicism. <laughs> of it was, and I didn't mean that to be a recording oh, of no, some no. kind of truth. No, no, but I, it was definitely my family yeah. upbringing. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I suggest maybe just read either when we talk with God or Home of the World. And yeah, I'm not going to read all of these. Yeah. yeah. Um. So. Um, I'm going to read the poem of the world, which um, you know we will get back to others. But um, this is a poem I've worked on again and again and again, and this I think is sort of the clearest statement of where that sense of wonder has evolved into something that is almost a daily experience. So that's what I. Um, maybe that's where it wants to go and what it should be. I'm not telling anybody what it should be. The poem of the world reveals itself like a doe's hoof tapping ice till she can drink. Startles like a rust of purple on this falls for Scythia leaves, though it may have used that small voice every year unheard. Blinks like red and blue potatoes dug this morning drying in the sun, testing their startled, untrained eyes. It's the unexpected tickle the fit of shared laughter in our urgency of touching that becomes another way of making love. It's an ocean beach of pebbles that suddenly starts singing, each stone its own tink together, 
a glorious, indifferent song. And it's the voice of each bird I have only heard as morning chorus, landing with its own song and bright, perfect body in my brain. It is even, now I begin to see them, the subtraction of birds, taking summer with them, too busy to announce their leaving. The poem of the world wants me to wake in my own body. It is astonished I might let these supple bones grow brittle. It is the sudden thing I trust. So that's it. The other poems are there. We can get to them. But I, I do want time for people to share. So thoughts at this point? Any discussion? I'm still thinking about a minister crying. I mean, that's like, what? Yeah. That's just so different from the way I was raised. And I'm just like, it would have been nice to yeah. sit in that church. Yeah. Yeah. Scatter, something I've noticed in the, the poems you shared is um, how embodied they are mm -hmm. and how um, I think for me wonder and awe um, and I was, I was raised Catholic had um, a much more disembodied kind of quality mm -hmm. and even though like I mean, I think Catholicism and even Christianity is like, what a fleshy religion, right? Like, literally of the flesh, you know, focused on this person. Um, however, like, wonder and awe in an as an embodied kind of emotion and quality, something that for me came later in life. Um, but it's so alive in your poems, just how incarnated they are. Um, and like in the last poem, the, the part of it that actually struck me the most was about um, the, just the detail of um, holding the glass of water toward the man um, and the eyes. And um, so I just really appreciate how uh, visceral and embodied your communication and expression of wonders. Thanks. Um, I do think Christianity often purports to be about the flesh, about our bodies and our um, presence and our humanity, but it also rigorously abstracts. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And virtue becomes not the details of connecting and being intimate, but some abstraction about what's good. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I won't speak for other traditions. Um, I think, um, married to someone who's Jewish, I find Susan's sense of family um, healing and much, and restorative to me and that sense of intimacy and, um, you know, history and um, cherishing ancestors and stuff. I wasn't raised to be good at that. Um, so, um, I, ha I have a number of these poems here, but do people, anyone who's brought something that they'd like to share that sort of expresses um, that their sense of wonder or that? I have one. Or, like or you can just tell stories too. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. I don't know what, if this is really a poem, um, but it does raise a couple questions for me. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see what they are in just a moment. So this is something Vermonters can relate to. It's called birches. Mm. So if you live out in the country, yeah. like many people here do, Middlesex. Um, so birches. When sun, and if you want to close your eyes, just for a second. When sun catches the birches, even for a moment, that drab winter day just melts away. Their paper bark, a canvas, for your thoughts and visions, here in this darkest time of year. Branches gleaming white, dazzling bright in contrast to her neighbors, whose stalwart evergreen spikes last throughout the year and deck our halls with Christmas cheer. Stop here, it's a haiku. Or go on. 
along with our thoughts, power outage from the storm, deep reflection brings protection. Remembering what we've heard from those who know the word, pure silence within, we begin again. Freed of expectations, we make new relations with ourselves and those we value. Regardless of where they are, what culture they represent, fellow creatures worthy of respect. Then bird flies by above the tree, interrupting reverie. So the question is, was I better off stopping at the haiku point, which was way up there? No. Or was it helpful to get to the end? And so that was one question. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'll stop right there. And there's a, obviously a correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> really, I guess it depends. So. <laughs> right. No, but in your experience as poets. Anybody? I, I would like to sort of, I like that you had us close our eyes. It was easy to get lost in the sounds and the rhyming. I would like to see it written. I feel oh, like yeah, that sorry. would help me. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> just, yeah, it would be interesting to juxtapose those two experiences, but I love the cadence of your reading as well. Right. right. And that's actually my other question, is that I tend to write on my phone. Yeah. Wow. And then I, it goes fast. And then I'm like, well, that's so fast. And everybody keeps giving me books that are empty pages for telling me to write down. <laughs> and I don't have time. So I guess this good question is like. And then you go like, use your phone. And then I use yeah. my phone, and it's so fast, and I can edit so quickly. Yeah. So I don't know, you know? That's really like my liked, second question. I really like that you embedded a haiku in another poem. Yeah. I thought it was fun. Yeah. That wasn't intentional. It was, it was really me saying, hey, should I stop here? <laughs> I think it's nice that it keeps going. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like Tonkas that have the haiku at the end. It appears as at the beginning. Right. Okay. There's a Megan O'Rourke poem that when I first read it, I gasped at the ending. Like, you know, I read a lot of poetry. It doesn't happen that often. I thought it was an incredible, she does this incredible shift at the end. I was trying to find it. Well, that's not going to work. Because I can't remember the title. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> Which poet? Megan O'Rourke. Oh, yeah. And it's her first book, Half-Life. And mm -hmm. there's a poem midway in Half-Life that just moved. <gasps> yeah. It was such an extraordinary revelation, the way she shifted in that poem. Because I also think I've, I worked a lot in human services, which I have to say was pretty traumatizing. But I was, you know, mostly it was grim. And, and all the statistics about, you know, if you grow up in poverty, uh, da, 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 and your father has a drug problem, and, you know, all these things that, okay, it'll affect your future in this way. But, you know, so I teach at CCV. I had this kid in my class, well, he's not, a young adult in my class. And he was <laughs> we talking. We have to change our perspective. <laughs> <Yes. a little laughs> <laughs> he was talking about his, you know, his experience being in foster care. And I thought, that's a really familiar story. I think I must have known him when he was young. And sure enough. So what was great was that you know, the, the likelihood of you being in foster care and even making it through high school mm -hmm. radically reduces, right? Mm -hmm. But here he was, not only had he did make it through high school, but now he was in college. He got a place to live, which is not easy. He was, he was getting help raising his family. And I was just like, that's wonderful. That's about the human potential that yeah. you, know, you can lose. If you read all the research, you lose your wonder at what can happen mm -hmm. in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And I also want to say, thinking about ministers are not supposed to cry, teachers are not supposed to cry, right. or <laughs> smile. Right. Um, yeah. right. And I, I used to teach in New York City, and I was pretty good about the no crying, but um, <laughs> on September 11th, the principal read this mm. loudspeaker thing about people who had died like in our building, and I cried, and I was like, what do you expect? Like, don't do that in the middle of the school day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, teachers also, um, human services, and not yeah. supposed to show emotions. Yeah, I was talking, I was doing a workshop, and I, I started talking about this family, and I could feel a tear stir, and I thought, no, let's let's back away from that one. Yeah. Yeah. But it is hard. Yeah. You talked about wonder contradicts. Um, and I think this is, I, 
I think sometimes I think wonder can be marginalized because it contradicts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you're not supposed to cry and you're not supposed to smile and you're not supposed to um, you know, have these big emotions in the context of our very formal systems mm -hmm. that are supposed to perform the tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and even in listening to the poem about the, um, that with the haiku, it reminds me of my own experience of being in the woods and not being certain, like, well, should I, should I turn back now and go to the meeting that I'm supposed to be at? Should I stay out? Should I see what's over that next ridge? And so mm -hmm. the, yeah, yeah um, I'm really enjoying listening to these. Experiences yeah, wonder that are is shared. disruptive to systems, right? Yes. And, and maybe yeah. there should be more wonder in our systems because mm -hmm. there's room for improvement. <laughs> but it also makes sense to me in a different way today why my own experiences of wonder were squelched. Squelched. Mm -hmm. Like stop, stop experiencing wonder. We have places to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And stop asking me those difficult questions. Um, uh, uh, we have we have feelings that we need to manage. Don't you think, yeah. don't you think That's the, the frost word, poem, managed. The frost poem, Stopping by our Woods on a Snowy Evening, mm -hmm. is, yeah. is a little bit, mm -hmm. I mean, that may be why it kind of resonates as deeply as it does. You know, why so many people, but I have promises to keep and miles mm -hmm. to go yeah, before yeah. I sleep. Yeah. And Robert Frost also has a Birch's poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he does. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was, I was wondering. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Two words. Yeah. So, so uh, any others? Susan? Yeah, I'm going to read a poem. This is Grace Paley's posthumously published collection. And I'm going to try to read it without crying, because every time I've read it out loud, I've felt right. But you don't have to. Okay. <laughs> but I may not have to. Okay. And it's a isn't sort of and Sarah is being very helpful. Sarah. <laughs> okay. So this is called My Sister and My Grandson. I have been talking to my sister. She may not know she's been dust and ashes for the last two years. I talk to her nearly every day. I've been telling her about our new baby who is serious, comical, busy, dark. My sister, out of all the rubble and grit that is now her, my sister mutters, what about our old baby? He was smart, loving, so beautiful. Yes, yes, I said. Listen, just last week he stopped at my <laughs> just last week he stopped at my hallway door. He saw your small Turkish rug. He stared at it. He fell to his knees, his arms wide, crying, Jeannie, oh my Auntie Jeannie, remembered. Ah, her hard whisper came to me. Thank you, Grace. Now speak to him. Tell him he's still my deepest love. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how it's nature, it's human interactions. Um, you know, it's all kinds of contexts. But I think one aspect of it is it's, it's almost always specific. Um, for me, it is. It's the specific. It, the generalizations usually don't get me, and unless they're really big enough. <laughs> well, it's the surprise. It's the and the surprise. I mean, that's what you know. In that poem, for me, it's it's the surprise and the the surprised connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That people have, whether you're alive or dead, or yeah. you know, but that's the wonder. But to your point too about it being specifics, it's like you're seeing things differently. Yes. All, of a, all of a sudden. There's a shift. All of a sudden, there's ordinary things. You're seeing something different yeah. in them. Mm -hmm. Seeing them differently, yeah. or something like that. That, mm -hmm. that brings on this sense of wonder that just maybe wasn't there in the, mo the moment before. Yeah, absolutely. I see that in your poetry a, a, a fair amount. Uh, other people. Yes, Mark. Sarah. Oh, you can, you can go first. Go ahead. My wife had a had until just recently a one hundred year old great uncle. Sarah and I talked about this a little bit. Not uncle, but great uncle. Mm -hmm. 
was your grandmother's brother. And just recently, uh, she's in her 70s. And it was a sense of wonder to have this person still living, who she known since she was a little kid. So he sent out uh, photos, blowouts of people who had visited him during his 100th year. And he put them on the back of the date. So he had me and our dog and him and have a good life. Mm. And then soon after that, his daughter, Cynthia's second cousin, called him and said that he was starting to fade. She said, we better come over. It was just over in New Hampshire. So we got there. He died. He died 10 minutes before we got there. Mm -hmm. And his son, his grandson, rather, was in the house. He entered the garage, weeping. His daughter was there. She was weeping. And there was a sense of wonder that he was dead now. He had just died, but then that he had lived a hundred years and yeah. done this farewell mainly. Mm -hmm. Not just to us, but to many people. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. As far as almost a knowing yeah. on yeah. the part of this person. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which is, again, quite amazing and wonderful. Yeah. Sarah? Sure. I have two, they're, they're very short, and I should say I uh, grew up in the Northeast Kingdom, which has inspired like a great appreciation of nature and a sense of wonder. Um, so the first one's short, and the second one is a little longer. Uh, and this is actually about East Hill Road. We've got some middle sense people. <laughs> uh, amphibian migration, Vermont. Headlights cut through twilight on a mud dirt road, picking out wood frogs, bellies bared towards home. Wet white prows of small damp boats, are sailing through the puddles, stiff-backed with hope. And the other one has a long title. Yeah. I'm losing my prescription glasses in a lake in Vermont in August and sitting on an islet waiting for my cousin to canoe back with other prescription glasses. The glass raft carrying my seeing sank and bore all perception to the depths of the lake. Mm -hmm. My double-crossed eyes are crooked turned away from sun's white flicker burn. Water skews up a flat papered wall where snakily silver wavelets crawl. Now the loons have whooped three times since my second sight went down. So I latch one lid and wait. Mm -hmm. That's great. Right? I can't relate to both of them. <laughs> um, that feels very visceral. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Just asking my son, my grandson today. I said, well, "What is what is the amphibian crossing like? When it's now?" Yeah. Oh, it's. I heard the papers for the first time two days ago. Oh yeah. If you're on Front Porch Forum in many towns in Vermont, you get the notices about. Okay. Don't splash them. Okay. Any other poems, Joan? Did you have anything you want to read? Um. No pressure, but. I think so. I, I wanted to read those. Vita has a book. Oh, oh, yeah. oh um, actually, I was just thinking about wonder and uh, talking about folks who are in the ministry, teachers, human services, and how exhausting certainly it can be. But I remember having done some human service work yourself. Oh, of course. <laughs> 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 I hope, yeah. Um, but I was thinking about the times that people that I was ostensibly there to support, to be the do-gooder, <laughs> that brought me wonder and on. There was a young woman, she was around 19, something like that, who had never um, lived independently. And she lost her mother, her aunt, and her grandmother in a horrible tragedy. It was terrible, terrible. And uh, her mother had actually been her guardian as well, and she had graduated from year 32. Uh, but never learned to read or write, so she was really vulnerable. Anyway, we were driving down the road and once again trying to find a home for her. And um, she started taking phone calls on herself from her mother, who had just died this tragedy several days before. And at first I was like, no, you know, this, is, this is crazy. And then the, the, the sense of wonder came over me, my gosh, she, She's talking with her mother, and that is real. Yeah. And it was uh, so. I mean, sometimes, often, as I got further along in the decades of my work, I hoped for 
to be open to that. Yeah. And, and I hadn't ever thought of that until we discussed the wonder. So sometimes it is, an, an, I think, important to be open to the wonder and the learning that we gain from that intimate connection with someone who has great need um, and um, to stay with that rather than think of ourselves as doing good. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. There's a line from Thoreau that says, if I should see a man coming towards me to do me good, I should run as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> but I did bring a, a poem of James Cruz that's yeah. in the anthology sure. of Poem City. Yeah, good. And it's uh, interesting enough, titled Awe. <laughs> and I, I did, I did my homework. I told Scudder I looked up in Webster the definition of wonder and awe and all that. But anyway, James does it much better. <laughs> awe. It's a shiver that climbs the trellis of the spine, each tingle of bright white morning glory breaking into blossom beneath the skin. It can happen anywhere, anytime, even finding the sleeve of ice worn by a branch all morning now fallen on a bed of snow. You can choose to pause, pick it up, hold the cold thing in your hand or not. Few tell us that wonder and awe are decisions we make daily, hourly, minute by minute in the tiny offices of the heart. <laughs> Tilting the head to look up at every tree turned into a chandelier by light striking ice in just the right way. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was That's great. an apt awe. And totally yeah. with what we've been talking about. Yeah. Right. yeah. Do you know where that's posted? I'm sorry, what? Is that in the, the, in, uh, in the current the poem, poem city? city? Where is that posted? I, I'd like to take my grandson by and let him read that in the window. Where is it? Uh, yeah, like where, where is it actually is it posted, posted, posted in, on the, in the store? Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah. We can look it up. You can, yes. you can look them up. Yeah. 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 Cool. James Cruz, C-R-E-W-S. And where is James? Okay. It, oh, actually, the location oh, is. Yes, <laughs> I can't. I can't find it. Um, yeah. I'm, I thought in the in the. How is it? We can get it. Yeah. Okay. But if you go on the Calicopper Library website, it will tell you where he's located. Okay, okay. And his last name is spelled C R E W S. Right. Thank you. Sure. sure. Did you find it? It, it? Are there others? Folks Cruise, who were on Cruise, 67. James. 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 67. Yeah. Well, she was one where it was physically posted. Yeah, it, it should tell you. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But it's on the website. It's on the okay. Thanks. Library Thanks. website. Thanks. Yeah. Um. I'll share something I noticed with a lot of what people have shared. There's a lot of wonder in the transition, like between life and death and mm -hmm. family members. Oh, here it is. 27 State Street. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. That's okay. Yeah, no, I, I just think, and, and there's so many, I'm actually, pregnant with my first baby and that has been yeah, seeing it on the ultrasound that was like a moment of like oh my god it's like moving and like yeah. hi <laughs> like this little being and it's like wow just really really knocked my socks off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and going with the discussion about specifics, you can't get much more specific than that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I wanted to read one poem that's in this by Lucille Clifton, who is just, she's just astonishing. And, what? Second page of the book. Uh, so, or somebody else can read it if they would like. You want to read I'll read it. it. Yeah. Cutting rooms. Curling them around, I hold their bodies in obscene embrace, thinking of everything but kinship. Collards and kale strain against each strange other, away from my kiss-making hand and the iron bed pot. The pot is black, the cutting board is black, my hand. And just for a minute, the greens roll black under the knife 
and the kitchen twists dark on, it, on its spine, and I taste in my natural appetite the bond of live things everywhere. What I, what I love about this poem is the, her own experience of her own blackness and that as the way into the glory of the world. And then the gift of sharing it in a poem so that if you're not black, you get to go there too. You know, and, and that just feels like that kind of opening that you know, I don't know, that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, mm. we don't, we're not doing a lot of that. We're not finding that kind of opening for each other and in each other. So that, that's what blew me away about the poem. And when I mentioned it, Joan said, this is one of your favorites. Or one of your favorites. Um, I, I think we have to close fairly soon. I wanted to read one other. So what I would say is um, all the things that make wonder seem ex exceptional or marginal or um, inaccessible, bullshit. It's what makes us a lot. You know, it's sort of the bedrock. It's not, it's not like this strange place you go to. It's, and I think about what do we need to survive, um, you know, the human destruction that we're, we're all aware of and living with. And it feels like it's more than goodwill. It's more than, it, 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 it's not that it isn't these things, but it's goodwill, it's new strategies, but it's so much more, it's a shift much deeper and different than that. And I suspect this has something to do with it. So this poem I read um, is by um, William Meredith. And um, it's called The Illiterate. And I read this poem, and then it hit me two I read it, and I liked it, and then it hit me once, and then it hit me again. So I'm going to just offer that. Um, does somebody want to read this? Anyway? Uh, oh, okay. Touching your goodness, I am like a man who turns a letter over in his hand. And you might think this was because the hand was unfamiliar, but truth is the man has never had a letter from anyone. And now he is both afraid of what it means and ashamed because he has no other means to find out what it says than to ask someone. His uncle could have left the farm to him, or his parents died before he sent them word, or the dark girl changed and want him for beloved. Afraid and letter proud, he keeps it with him. What would you call his feeling for the words that keep him rich and orphaned? Mm -hmm. And beloved. Wow. Wow. And it, it feels to me like this. Obviously, that's the experience of someone who might be illiterate. So, at the surface level, that's obvious. But what struck me about the poem is that it's touching your goodness, is what it starts with. And so, it's something about not knowing how to come to terms with someone else's goodness and being illiterate in some sense about that, which just um, feels like a very, yeah, go ahead. Well, and the, the man doesn't actually exist. The man is in right. his imagination. Yeah, yeah. He's just like this character. Yeah, there's, yeah. No, there's no actual illiterate person. Oh. Right, right. And, and what it seems to be, to me, to be talking about is when I think about it in the context of what we're talking about in wonder, with wonder, the, 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 that goodness that we encounter with wonder is like we don't know what to make of it. And I think we feel sometimes illiterate. And we sort of hold the letter and we hold the experience. And, right? 
And, and you never open it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's it's as though awe uh, and wonder are a highly suspicious act, you know. So you don't trust it. Um, I I have this sense that in our culture it's not so permissible to express wonder and awe um, where we are in life in this in this particular world right now. So he he, he grabbed it and yeah. brought it in through the home of the beautiful, beautiful. And I think about Robin Wall Kimmer and the, you know, a, a, a tradition that's grounded in gratitude. Yeah. That's not really what my tradition is grounded in. It's grounded in salvation. Mm -hmm. From what? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I struggle with that. Mm -hmm. So. It's interesting. Our culture is a afraid in many ways of, of, in fact, wonder and awe. It doesn't know how to deal with it, or quote, somebody said, manage it. Yeah. I thought that was well said. Um, so we, but we also, in some cultures especially, the savant, the idiot savant, yeah. that Rain Man, if anybody remembers mm -hmm. the great yeah. movie, and other cultures too, They there's a element of worship, not worship's not quite the word, word mm. but well, I don't know what the right word would be. A welcoming, an honoring. Oh, but, right, kind of an honoring or giving a special place to um, those that exhibit extraordinary qualities, yeah. which we don't understand and can't really maybe accept. So it's quite interesting, the whole savant idea in our culture. I mean, some of this is touching on yeah. that, to that, on that level perhaps makes us uncomfortable, that whole contrary yeah. Yeah. So any, that, we're really at our time, um, and I thank everybody for being here. Any last or final comments? Or? Well, thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Joan, for hosting us yeah. and <laughs> welcoming us here. Yeah. The fireplace without the fire is just the right one. <laughs> Not enough wood fires for those. <laughs>